1 Samuel chapters 4, 5, and 6 record for us a time in Israel's history when they were at war with their nemesis, the Philistines, and how that they take the ark of God out to battle with them, thinking it's going to be some type of good luck charm, but it ends up being captured, but then is returned to Israel. So, 1 Samuel chapter 4, you remember in verse 3, it says, When the people had come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord from Shiloh to us, that when it comes among us, it may save us from the hand of our enemy. So they're treating it sort of like a lucky rabbit's foot, uh, some type of good luck charm, a talisman, if you will. So it tells us in verse 4 that they sent for the ark at Shiloh, Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli. They are with the people. They take it out. It says in verse 5, the ark of the covenant came into the camp. All Israel shout, shouted loudly, and the earth shook. In chapter 4, verse 10, however, the effect that they had hoped for, the victory that they anticipated by simply having that material object among them, did not unfold. So, 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 10 tells us this, So the Philistines fought, and Israel was defeated, and every man fled to his tent. There was a very great slaughter, and there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. Also, the ark of God was captured, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. So you have an occasion here where this ark is taken away in the midst of battle. It's taken by pagans, by people who are not uh, believers in Jehovah, worshipers of Jehovah, and they take it away. Uh, chapter 5 tells us how the Philistines are plagued by having the ark among them. They took it down to the house of their gods, and there were repeated things that unfolded to show that Jehovah truly was superior to their false gods, but they decide to send it back. They decide that they don't want the trouble anymore because they had been plagued as a result of of having the ark there. In 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 7 then, it says, Now therefore make a new cart, take two milk cows that have never been yoked, and hitch the cows to the cart, and take their calves away from them. Then take the ark of the Lord, and set it on a cart, and put the articles of gold, which are returning to him as a trespass offering, in a chest by its side, then send it away, and let it go, and watch. If it goes up the road to its own territory, to Beth Shemesh, then he has done us this great evil. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that struck us. It happened to us by chance. And so it goes on to tell us how they took the two milk cows and separated from the calves. They put the ark on a cart, and the milk cows were yoked to it and the gifts, as it said there, to pull it back to Israel, back to the territory of Judah. Now, here's the thing about it. When they separated the milk cows from their calves, normally the cows would go to the calves. But because it was of God, those cows go back. They go away from their calves, and they head back to the territory of Judah. And so that tells us that it was of the Lord, and it told the Philistines it was of the Lord. And so it is returned then in chapter 7, verse 2. It says this, So it was that the ark remained in kirjath Jerim a long time. It was there 20 years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. So this is before the time of Samuel, before he really comes to prominence in Israel. He comes into prominence very soon hereafter. Uh, and then Saul is anointed as king. But then we notice that David comes to the throne. And if you look at First Chronicles chapter 13, which is, of course, a parallel to First, Second Samuel, First Kings. But in First Chronicles chapter 13, what we want to notice is that after a very long time, David decides to move that ark 
from Kerjatirim to a place that he had prepared for. And what we want to notice here is in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 2, David said to all the assembly of Israel, if it seems good to you, and if it is of the Lord our God, let us send out to our brethren everywhere who are left in the land of Israel, and with them to the priests and Levites who are in the cities and their common lands that they may gather together to us and let us bring the ark of our God back to us, for we have not inquired at it since the days of Saul. And so you have this occasion where he wants to move it to Jerusalem from Kerjat Jerim, which was not far away, but he wants to move it back to Jerusalem. And so the assembly is pleased with that. In fact, it says in verse 4, all the assembly said that they would do so for the thing was right in the eyes of all the people. So they're very excited about this. They accept what David has to say, and they put forth effort to help make it come about. So verse 7 says, They carried the ark of God on a new cart from the house of Abinadab, and Uzzah and Ahio drove the cart. So they begin to move it exactly how the Philistines had moved it, with oxen or cows, if you will, cattle as what we would think of, though oxen are different than cattle. But the idea is you, you have two oxen who are pulling this cart, and the ark of God is setting up on it. But in verse 9, 1 Chronicles 13, verse 9, notice that it says, when they came to Kidon, or Achans, as the uh, second Samuel says, to Kidon's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen stumbled. So the ox stumble, and the ark was in danger of falling off and hitting the ground. So Uzzah puts out his hand to steady that ark. He touches the ark so it doesn't fall off. It says in verse 10, Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and he struck him because he put his hand to the ark, and he died there before God. So Uzzah paid for his actions with his life. Now, when you look at this, you may have some sympathy for him because it seems like a natural, almost automatic reaction that if this great symbol of God dwelling among his people, this ark, is about to fall off the cart and hit the ground, that you would just instantly reach out to try to steady it. And that appears to be what Uzzah did on this occasion, but he violated the law of God because no one was to touch that ark, and so he was struck dead. Now, the question is, why did David move the ark by putting it on a cart instead of how, how God instructed him? He may have done it because that's the way the ark was moved by the Philistines. He looked back and saw, well, they did it this way and had success in moving it, and so we can move it that way as well. But whatever his reasoning was, it was a violation of the will of God. And they come to realize this in First Chronicles chapter 15. And notice here, verses 1 and 2, it says, David built houses for himself in the city of David, and he prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for it. And David said, No one may carry the ark of God but the Levites, for the Lord has chosen them to carry the ark of God and to minister before him forever. So they realize it's not to be put on a cart, but it's to be carried by the Levites. Down in verse 15, it says the children of Israel, or the children rather of the Levites, bore the ark of God on their shoulders by its poles, as Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. So if you recall, the ark was built with rings on the side of it so that poles could be stuck through it, and those poles then were put through the rings, and then the ark was lifted via the poles by the Levites, and they walked along carrying that. They put the poles on their shoulders. So they figured out that's how we need to move it. And in First Chronicles 15, they move it properly according to God's will. In verse 13, 
David made mention of their previous failure. He says, for because you did not do it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not consult him about the proper order. So there was a proper order for moving it, as we've already described. And that's such an important lesson in principle. There's a proper order. They failed to move it properly, correctly the first time because they didn't consult God. You see, God had given them the way to do it. And that was the proper way and the only way that was appropriate for them to move that ark. But they had not consulted him, and so they did not do it properly the first time. The second time, they consulted God, and they did move it in the proper order according to the right way. In chapter 16, verse 1, then, we see where they had success, where before they failed, now they have success. In First Chronicles 16, verse 1, it says, So they brought the ark of God and set it in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. Then they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before God. So they had success. They got it to where they intended for it to go and were therefore able to offer up sacrifices to God. Now let's think about this great lesson on this idea of the oxen stumbled and the problems that surround that. Why is it that that happened? Why are these problems the ones that came up? You see, when the proper order is not followed, when God's law is not consulted and we do things our way, then there will be problems because sooner or later the oxen will stumble. Sooner or later there will be some type of stress or some type of event, some type of thing that unfolds that reveals the weakness or the wrongness of how we are doing something. Sometimes people recognize that, and frankly, sometimes people don't because they're unwilling to see the problem of what they were doing. You know, it may work for a while, and there may be apparent progress. Think about when David began to move the ark the first time back there in 1 Samuel in chapter 13, how that they began to make progress for a while from the time that it was loaded up on the ark until the time that the oxen stumbled, it they were advancing. They were able to put it on the cart. They were able to begin to move it. And so there was apparent progress for a while, and sometimes there are things we do, and there's apparent progress but it's not the right way. But there's a time that comes when there is a um, stressor, as we said before, and the consequences will unfold. They'll be inevitable. So when we think about today and a church and how it functions today, the, the work of the church, the worship of the church, uh, what the church is doing, how it is organized. Is it in the right way or not the right way? If it's not the right way, then things are going to unfold eventually down the road. It could be that a church splits. It could be that people leave for other pursuits. They either decide to go and become a part of like a community church instead of being in the church of the Lord and a a congregation pattern after the New Testament, because over time, if they've gotten acclimated to things that were not right, then you know they'll move on. They'll, they'll find something more interesting, more intriguing, more exciting to move on to. It may be that they just give up altogether. They just decide, well, we're not going to go to church anymore because there's no point. Well, then there may also be the consequence of when people do this, when, when these things unfold, that is, they're not doing things in the proper order, souls can be lost and the Lord shamed. Because if we're not doing things the right way, then it is going to bring reproach on God, and it will become very apparent and very obvious. And 
souls that are involved in it because they're being led astray will be lost. So we have to be very careful, very cautious to consult the Lord and to do things in the proper order. Because when we do that, that is what will be successful. Now, success is defined by the Lord is another way to put this. It may be slower, you know, just like the, the oxen pulling the cart would move along quicker, in theory, than men carrying the ark. But the right way was for the Levites to carry it. And it would be slower, but it was right. And there's more exertion by men, whereas the oxen, the animals, take the load. Well, that relieves men of having to bear that burden. Well, doing it the Lord's way, it meant more of a burden for men. But that was the right way to do it. It would go slower. It would mean more effort on the part of individuals. But the right way is the way to achieve the desired outcome. Now, we have all of that as, a, as an illustration, as an example of where something was done improperly, and there was failure, and then it was done properly, and there was success. So think about that. Those principles echo throughout the Bible, and they're still applicable to our times in our day. You know, there is a proper order. When we look into the New Testament, there is a proper authority or a proper order of doing things. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, remember the Apostle Paul wrote there, And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Do all in the name of Jesus Christ. That's the idea of doing it by his authority, doing it as he has commanded it to be done, not inserting our will, substituting our desires or what pleases us or what we think is going to work, but doing what he says in the way that he says to do it. Now, just briefly, we want to illustrate this with the Lord's Supper. In the New Testament, we see that the Lord's Supper was established by Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 26 and verses 26 to 29. This is during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, of course. In verse 26, it says, As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take ye, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And so he gives a command of what we are to partake, what we are to do, and it lays that out for us. That's the authority of the Lord. So he says, partake of that bread, which was unleavened bread, partake of the fruit of the vine, which is grape juice, and you partake of that to remember my body and to remember my blood, to remember that sacrifice that he gave for us. That's why we are to do it. So that that's the what, if you will. And that's a direct statement that's given. We know when to partake of it by an approved example. So when you get to the book of Acts chapter 20, Acts 20 verse 7, it says, Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. So the brethren gathered on the first day of the week, just like in 1 Corinthians 16 makes a reference to the saints gathering on the first day of the week. So on Sunday is when we are to partake of the Lord's Supper. We see an approved example as Paul is among the saints here at Troas. Now, that is when we do it. Now, how often is the question? Well, there is a necessary implication in this. When it says they came together to do it on the first day of the week, the idea is they do it every first day of the week. So, for instance, when you're driving down the highway and you see a sign for food at an exit, 
one of those blue signs, and you see a sign for Chick-fil-A, what does it say at the bottom of that Chick-fil-A sign? It says, closed Sunday. Now, we understand that that means it's closed every Sunday, not just last Sunday, not just the coming up Sunday, but when it says closed Sunday, it means every Sunday. And when it says that the disciples came together on the first day of the week, that saying that that was their habit, that was their practice. They came together on a weekly basis to break bread, and the break bread there is simply a shortened form of to protect the Lord's Supper. It's referring to part of what's done in order to convey the idea of the whole. It's not them coming together to, to eat a meal. It's them coming together to observe the Lord's Supper. And we can study more on that if you have questions about that. But that's what's taking place there in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. Now, one of the things we want to see when it says unleavened bread and fruit of the vine, that the unleavened bread could be partaken of, whether that's homemade unleavened bread or store-bought unleavened bread. It really doesn't make a difference. This is the idea of the general authority that's involved here. So partaking of home-prepared, homemade unleavened bread, or partaking of store-bought unleavened bread, you're still observing the Lord's memorial, still partaking of that which represents his body. It doesn't change the command. It could be one large piece that each person breaks off of. It could be small pieces that people eat. It can be served in a metal tray or a basket or a ceramic um, plate or whatever it may be. It doesn't change that command. So that general authority is inclusive. And those things do not alter what we've been commanded to do. The fruit of the vine. The grape juice, it could be homemade, never heard of anybody doing that, or it could be store-bought. It can be served in plastic containers or glass containers or metal containers, small ones or large ones. It's really irrelevant. It doesn't change the command to partake of the fruit of the vine. But specifically, when it says the unleavened bread, that means you can't have regular bread. It means you can't have donuts or cake or something like that. And when it says fruit of the vine, that means you can't have some other type of juice. You can't have just tap water. You can't have coffee or tea. You can't have pineapple juice. So it's a change if you go to any of those other things, and it violates what the Lord has established. So we understand how simple that is. When it talks about uh, partaking of this on the first day of the week, well, you could do that at 7 a.m. or at noon or at 5 p.m. It's still the first day of the week. But if you partake of it on Saturday or you partake of it on Monday, well, that violates the command, the example that we have in Acts 20 and verse 7. So you think about those general principles of authority, those basic principles of authority. When you think about a direct statement, you think about a proved example, you think about a necessary inference or implication contained in those generic and specific authority. And if you need a deeper dive into the authority, please reach out. Let us know. We're happy to do that. But here's the thing. We want to apply it to the work of the church. Okay. There's authority, which in the account of the ark, in David moving the ark, was referred to as the proper order. You see, there is a proper order or there is authority in the New Testament for the work of the church, and it outlines for us what is to be done. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy and tells him there, But if I am delayed so that you know how you ought to behave yourself, conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. 
So the church is to be the pillar and ground of the truth. So we understand that the church's primary mission in this world is to teach the gospel. And that comes in two basic forms. Part of that is teaching the gospel to the world so that people can learn and be saved. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 8, the Apostle Paul says, I robbed other churches taking wages from them to minister to you. So in other words, he's saying, I was at Corinth teaching you the gospel. There were other churches sending me money to provide for my needs so I could teach to you. And one of those churches, by the way, is Philippi in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Remember that it says here that the Apostle Paul was helped out by them, and they did a good thing here in Philippians 4 verse 15. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. So he's saying that you help me in going out to teach the gospel. So there is the teaching of the gospel to the world around us, but there's also the teaching of the gospel to the saints, as Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 16 makes mention. Ephesians 4, 16, for from the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So the body is to edify itself, to strengthen itself. Earlier in chapter 4, verse 11, he talked about there are apostles, prophets, pastors, uh, teachers, evangelists, that these are roles within God's people, within the body of Christ universally that help to build up churches. And here he's talking about, then he gets down to the saints at Philip or the saints at Ephesus are to build each other up. As a body, they are to strengthen one another. So part of the work of the church and the primary work of the church is to teach the gospel. But it also has a role in providing benevolent help to saints who are in need. And the Bible is very clear about this. There's a consistent pattern throughout the New Testament in Acts 2, in Acts 4, in Acts 6, in Acts 11, in Romans 15, in 2 Corinthians 8, 2 Corinthians 9. Again and again, it shows where local congregations helped out saints in need, and those are the only ones they helped out. See, that's a case of specific authority. Benevolent work of congregations was only when there were saints in need. So, Acts chapter 4 and verse 32 beginning, it says, Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them, among the saints, who lacked, for they all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and he distributed to each one as any one had need. So, Here's a case where there's an emergency where brethren run out of the ability to provide for their food, maybe clothing, maybe shelter, but there's an emergency situation. And the saints step in, the congregation comes together, they they individually sell these things, but then they lay it at the apostles' feet. That's the idea of a common treasury. So it's showing a collective action here. So the church is helping saints who are in need in an emergency situation. But 1 Timothy chapter 5 also shows us where there's an ongoing situation, where it's not an emergency, it's not something that is a temporary need that needs to be met. But this is a case where there are those who 
are in need of ongoing help. And notice now, because this is very specific, what the stipulations are, right? So 1 Timothy chapter 5, in beginning in verse 3, he's talking about widows who are in need. So 1 Timothy 5 verse 3, honor widows who are really widows. So those who are in a position where somebody is not helping them, they can't help themselves, well, then the church needs to step in. But notice, he regulates this very tightly. In verse 4, But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first to learn show piety at home and to repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. So where does the primary responsibility rest? Well, it rests with children or grandchildren. They are to look out after these widows. Not the church first, but the family first. And you keep on reading verses 5 through 15, and he lays out quite a few stipulations. In other words, this woman who is really a widow has to have been a faithful Christian through her life, married to one husband through her life. She has to be the age of 60 or older, because under 60, they're not to be taken into the number, and that idea of being taken into the number is on regular support, you know, month in and month out or week in and week out, however that is defined whenever the support is given. Verse 16, then, here's a key. First Timothy 5, verse 16. If any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them and do not let the church be burdened that it may relieve those who are really widows. In other words, the church's responsibility is only to help faithful Christian women who have been widowed and don't have any family that's taking care of them. So the church is the last resort. And when you think about it, that makes sense. Family needs to step up, right? Part of God's will is and always has been honor your father and mother. And that's not just saying for little children to respect them, to obey them. That's saying for those of us who are older to honor them. It has a monetary or material implication to that. We take care of them as they get older and they have these needs. So the church can support a faithful Christian woman when there is no other help available there. But the church is the last resort. So that's why we say that the teaching mission of the church is the primary mission that it has. It is a secondary mission for it to help out saints who are in need. Not the world in general, but just saints who are in need. And so keep that in mind as we think about this. And that is the fact that not all churches of Christ respect what the Bible teaches on this issue. They don't do things that are the proper order. They claim to be of Christ, but through their actions, they show they are not. They're following their own will. The, the sign may say Church of Christ, but their actions declare they are their own leaders, their own masters, if you will. And we need to realize that there are warnings in the New Testament, and warnings need to be sounded about people who depart from the truth. In 2 John verse 9, it says, Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. You know, there may be people who initially have good intentions, but then they stray from the truth. They they want to help others. They, they have a kind and benevolent heart but they violate the will of God in the way they go about doing it. Just like David had a good intention of moving that ark and taking it to a place and, and going before the ark and calling on the name of the Lord. Before that, that was good, but he went about it the wrong way initially. You see, there are people who have initial good thoughts and ideas of what they want to do, but they go about it the wrong way. And they progressively get further and further from the truth. And then sometimes they'll make a very tortured appeal to the Word of God to try to justify it. They 
are people that we might call progressives, if you will. Well, we have to be warned about these things because they do not abide in the doctrine of Christ. They've transgressed it. They've gone beyond it, and they need to be identified. You know, sometimes people have a a bit of a hang-up on identifying those who are in error. Well, Romans chapter 16, verse 17, he says, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. So we have to be warned about those who depart from the truth because there are souls that are at stake. There are times when these individuals in the New Testament are identified very specifically, like 2 Timothy chapter 2, where it says there in verse 15, shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort. See, sometimes specific individuals or groups are identified to warn people, don't listen to what they're saying, don't follow in their path, don't be influenced by them, but mark them, note them, identify them, because they need to be ashamed of what they're doing, and others need to be warned not to go along with them. And so that brings us to this point in the lesson, and that is the Concord Church of Christ in Concord, North Carolina, is a so-called Church of Christ, that is departed from the proper order. They are not respectful of New Testament authority, but they have transgressed the doctrine of Christ, and they need to be noted, they need to be marked as unfaithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, me and my family, we have a connection to the Concord Church of Christ going back probably 30 years, and through the years, we've seen things that would be questionable, make us uncomfortable. We have understood there are problems along the way with marriage, divorce, and remarriage, and them accepting error on that. And now, it's abundantly clear they have violated the authority of the New Testament regarding the work of the church. They are in sin, and they are in error. So we're going to present some proof of this, and you can go to their website and see most all of this. There will be some right at the very end that we've obtained from another source, but you can go to their website and see here's what they're doing. It's open. It's declared. Uh, it is public knowledge, and we're just simply highlighting it here in this lesson. So the first thing we want to note is if you go to their events and activities calendar, and you notice on there, again, this is public, this is right alongside, when you notice their calendar, it talks about their worship services, their Bible classes, things that are authorized by the Bible for a church to engage in, what they're supposed to be engaging in. But alongside that, they post these various activities, including things that you see there of like the Carolina Bible Camp. It's a winter camp. Now, some may say, well, what's wrong with a Bible camp? Well, people getting together and young people getting together to study the Bible, there's nothing wrong with that. But this is a separate organization. This is a human organization that is formed and come together to do this. And this is a church marketing that for them or announcing that for them. And that's not something that should be done. This is not a work of the church. It's, it's not, the, the local congregation is not a marketing arm for human organizations. It would be like the the church marketing a college. It would be like them marketing 
a Christian owned business. And, you know, here's uh, Joe's excavating business or Bob's car wash. It, it just, it's not what's supposed to be done, but that's what they're doing. You can also see on the calendar there how they have a blessing bag packing. That is a part of the work of that local congregation of the Concord Church of Christ. They're engaged in that. Now, that's not authorized in the New Testament. You can't find it either by direct statement, approved example, or a necessary inference or implication. It's not there. They have a teen lunch and a Devo. Um, they advertise the idea of a social meal on there. They also have this idea of feeding the needy at the Opportunity House, and they're saying that that is a part of what they do. You can see this list of things, so you not only see the calendar and the dates and things like that, but if you scroll down below that, you see a description of what it is that they are involved in. These descriptions will tell you things about what's happening there at the Concord Church of Christ. And so let's notice this one. Uh, this one here is in March of 2024. And all this is on the website, by the way, uh, at the time of this recording, at least within a few days of it being recorded. It may or may not be there in the future, but it is there as of this recording. These are the screenshots uh, we took from the website. But they have a Friends Day where they... Um, so the youth group is encouraged to bring their friends to a park. It says to Village Park Shelter. Uh, time of Bible talk and study, games and food uh, provided. And then you have the, on March 29th, it looks like, a field day and fun hunt. It says this event is for all ages, but we especially hope to see K through uh, fifth grade. Kids come out, enjoy some holiday-themed fun at the grown home. So they're advertising these social activities for especially, particularly the youth to be involved in. And then in April, they have a kickball tournament uh, scheduled that they will be involved in at Dorton Park, it looks like. And then if you keep on going, you see in May that they have scheduled to host a thousand voices, which is a uh, again, a secular organization. Um, it's it's not just the church saying, hey, we're going to have the area-wide singing, but it is actually a third-party entity that goes there and hosts that event. They're essentially, um, whether they charge or they don't charge, they're, they're renting out, loaning out the church building for this third-party activity. And then they also are going to have a scavenger hunt, as you can see there, and then there's a Bible board game night. So this church is involved in what is typically called the social gospel, and they are doing things that are outside the doctrine of Christ because maybe it makes them feel good, or they think this is how people are going to be drawn in and encouraged and kept as a part of this group. But of course, a violation of the Word of God is sin, no matter the motivation and no matter the desire of what you want from that. But then also on their page to serve, the people are directed to reach out to the leadership. And so this is headed up by the elders of that congregation and notice the last thing that it mentions down there, serving neighbors, city, and the world with hospital snacks, meal packing, addiction support, foster care, and transition, and clothing closet. And they can do all of this through the dashboard on the website for their members. So this isn't just individuals doing it. This is the congregation being deeply involved as a church. They also have this thing that was on the calendar before about Pillar of Hope, and what that is is family addiction support group. So people who have family members that are in some kind of addiction, this is a support group for them in dealing with that no doubt difficult 
in hard situation. Now, they used to meet near the main Concord building in another building that the congregation owned. We'll talk more about this in a minute, but they ended up having to move, and now they are meeting this group that's promoted on the Concord Church of Christ website is now meeting at St. Mark's Lutheran Church in China Grove. Now, something else that they are doing there, and there's a picture of that St. Mark's Lutheran Church and where they're meeting. Uh, something else they're doing is promoting a dynamic marriage class, okay? Now, nothing wrong with teaching people about marriage, duties of husbands and wives, and how they can serve the Lord together and serve their spouses in a godly and righteous way. Nothing wrong with that. But here's the thing about it. It's $135 a couple, so they're charging people to take this class. And, uh, well, where's the provision for that in the Word of God? Um, so I'll leave that one right there. Another thing that's happening is if you go on to the county GIS website, and that's just basically the website that shows property ownership and um, things like that, you see on the block where the main building is. The main building is that one uh, toward the top right, and then the areas that are circled or outlined there are all owned by the Concord Church of Christ. Now, to be fair, a lot of this property was purchased and donated by a member of that congregation in years past. And so the question becomes, how are they using that? If it's used for Bible classes, for studies, things like that, or for extra overflow parking, fine. That's completely fine. But that's not what these things are being used for. Uh, it is understood in reliable uh, information here that they have rented out some of this property in times past to people that they thought they were helping out who were disadvantaged economically, and so they rented homes to them. And now, where the arrow is pointing to in the top left there, that's where that pillar of hope met, but now they're not meeting there any longer because it was announced to the congregation back in December of 2023 that the eldership had made an agreement with a organization that provides foster care transition. So when children age out of the foster care program, they turn 18. A lot of them still need a place to live. And so they've leased it to an organization that provides that service to foster children. And so they're renovating that, and leasing it out to them. That is, the, the group that is leasing it is renovating it for housing. And it's going to be leased out on a what we would consider to be a relatively long-term lease, but however long it is, whether it's a day or whether it's 10 years or whatever, they're leasing it out to that group, which is a violation of the New Testament. Churches are not in the property business to rent as homes or to rent as some type of charitable service to the community. However sympathetic we may be to people and their trials and difficulties, that's not what we see in the New Testament. And yet that is what's happening at the Concord Church of Christ. And so a question we have is, you know, how far is too far? Uh, how far can we go? For instance, with child care, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Well, if an individual is to do that, does that mean that the church can step in and uh, be the parent, uh, provide child care facilities for children, provide nonprofit food, clothing, and shelter for those who are in need? Like the Father is supposed to provide, First Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. If any does not provide for his own, especially for those of his own household, he is worse than an infidel, and he is denied the faith. So you think about this. How far is too far? Can a church step in and be a surrogate father or a surrogate mother? Well, that's not right. What about the idea of a wedding? You know, the Bible talks about that marriage is honorable among all. 
Matthew chapter, or rather Ephesians chapter 5, 22 to 23, talks about husbands and wives and their duties to one another. Well, since marriage is a good thing and a wedding, therefore, is a good thing, does that mean we can rent the church out as a facility to have weddings? Does it mean we can rent out equipment that we have or rent out the preacher to do weddings? Is that what it's about? What about the yard sign business, right? Romans 12 verse 15 says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who rejoice. Well, can we have a yard sign business as a church? You know, telling people happy birthday or happy wedding anniversary. Is that weird we do? What about the weeping part? Can a church have a funeral home? Can they provide funeral home services? You know, better go to the house of mourning than the house of feasting. Well, we could provide comfort and compassion to people if we have a funeral home. If we, you know, maybe leased out the property to a funeral home and let them be there. It's our chance to minister to people. You know, every violation of the Word of God is justified, it seems like, when people say, oh, it's our ministry. But it's not in the Word of God. It's not proper according to the Word of God. When we fail to consult God's law, we fail. It very well may be what other people do and what they're doing on an ongoing basis, but that doesn't justify it, doesn't make it right. And we may make progress. It may be working for a while. It may work for a long while, but eventually it will be revealed to be futile because it's not according to God's word. With a lot of the things we've been talking about, you know, the Concord Church of Christ is being beaten to death by community churches. And, and our guess is, this is just my theory, what they're trying to do is they're trying to keep up with community churches, trying to attract people who are drawn to those kinds of things. And so, they're going to fail, and they have failed because, well, the church over there is already split, and there's a significant portion of members who have left. And it's a good thing that they left, um, but they've objected to these latest things, but there's a whole lot there that is wrong from many years ago that people need to consider and be aware of and realize faithful Christians cannot be a part of, cannot have fellowship with the Concord Church of Christ. It is in sin. Our commitment must always be to seek to do the Lord's will, not to look to men as a standard, not to think of them as the ones who guide things or their ideas or the right way, not to follow our feelings in emotions as a guide, but to be content within the doctrine of Christ, to abide within the authority of the new covenant that's been sealed by the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, this lesson has been somewhat detailed in laying that foundation that undergirds the, the truth and the principles of how we are to conduct ourselves as the people of God. And we've gone through some specific things and been detailed in that. And maybe it is, though, that you have questions. You're welcome to reach out and to ask those questions. And we're happy to answer them. But we urge you, reflect on this, reflect on what the Word of God teaches, and be determined that you would be one devoted to God's Word and pleasing Him and not simply following along with the world and the things that it does. So consider these things.